verses 1 through 17. Joseph's brothers go to Egypt. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us, so that we may live and not die. Then ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others, because he was afraid, of, he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain, for the famine was in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the one who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from? he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, Your servants were twelve brothers, the sons of one man, who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and one is no more. Joseph said to them, It is just as I told you. You are spies. And this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your younger bro youngest brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison, so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. If you are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And he put them all in custody for three days. May the Lord have his blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. Let me apologize uh, right off the back if you find there that this would be a little crude, but there's no gentlemanly way to say this. And I need to tell you this story so that I can uh, help you understand where I'm coming from with this uh, sermon. I was in a restaurant earlier this week and I began to feel uh, extremely sick, extremely bloated. I just did not feel good at all. And I realized that I immediately, desperately needed to let some of that, uh, some of the gas out that was building up in my system. The good thing was that the uh, the music in the restaurant was really, really loud. I mean, it was a loud place, and I knew that I was okay, so I, this is embarrassing, but I actually timed my gas to the beat of the music so that, you know, nobody would be the wiser to it. And after the song was done, honestly, I started to feel a little bit better, and I knew I could leave. Um, and I finished my drink when I noticed that everyone was staring at me. And I came to the sudden realization that I was listening to my iPod through my earphones. <laughs> you ever had one of those moments that you knew you would never forget this day for the rest of your life? That this would be seared in your memory uh, until your last, uh, last moment on this earth? Sometimes these memories, sometimes these moments are a good thing. There's something that we want to hold on to, that we want to be there until the end. Maybe it was your wedding. Maybe, you know, that, that, that special day. Maybe it was the birth of a child. Maybe it was the, uh, the, the, the first time you learned how to ride a bike. And that one's fresh in my mind because Caleb did it this week. I'm pretty sure he still remembers it. Yeah, but these are the ones that we want to hold on to. These are the ones that we don't want to forget. We want them to stay fresh in our minds. But then there's a complete opposite end of the spectrum. There's the good memories that, that we don't want to forget. And then there's the other ones that we simply can't forget. And these are the moments that, that, that we remember things that we would like to forget, but that always seem to be there with us no matter how hard we try to get them out of our minds. This is what Joseph's brothers are up against in our scripture today. And I'm hoping by looking at their example and seeing what God did in their lives to move them through the process of regret into being okay with the past, that, that we can learn lessons from that and begin to move through our own issues. So let's start off with a word of prayer. Dear God, once again, we thank you for today. We thank you for your holy word. We thank you for this story. That we're in again for, for our, uh, our fifth week, God. And 
we, uh, we praise you that, that Joseph has such a wonderful story to tell. And we ask that you would help us to be able to hear it right now, God. Help us to be able to apply it to our own lives and allow us to leave here better people than we entered. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me start off this morning with doing a 30-second quick recap of where we've been that led us up to this part of the story. We start with Joseph, who is the youngest of 12 brothers, who is Daddy's favorite. And Daddy makes it known to everybody. Joseph winds up having some dreams, saying that his brothers are, are going to bow down to him. And he tells his brothers those dreams. His brothers get mad. They throw him in a cistern. They see a caravan traveling to Egypt. They dig him out. And they sell him as a slave to Egypt. So Joseph is off to Egypt. Joseph becomes a slave in the house of Potiphar, does a great job for Potiphar, however Potiphar's wife lies and says that Joseph was trying to take advantage of her. Joseph gets thrown in prison. While in prison, Joseph once again does a good job. He interprets the dreams of the baker and the cupbearer, interprets them accurately. The cupbearer goes to Pharaoh but forgets all about Joseph. A couple years later, two years later, the cupbearer says, oh yeah, there's this guy named Joseph. He tells Pharaoh about him. Pharaoh has some dreams. Pharaoh calls Joseph to him. Joseph tells Pharaoh's dreams, what they mean. Seven years, we're going to have a great harvest. You're going to have plenty of food. For seven years after that, though, it's going to be the worst famine that this land has ever seen. Pharaoh says, okay, that sounds good. I'm going to put you in charge of it to make sure that we're good. So he, Joseph gets out of prison. He's now made second in charge of all of Egypt. And for seven years, they have great growth. Joseph uh, gets a house, gets a family, and collects a whole bunch of food for Egypt. Well, the seven years are up. Now we're in the seven years of drought. And, and luckily, Joseph has collected enough food for Egypt that Egypt has plenty of food for all other people. In addition to having enough food for the people, they have enough food to sell to other people too, which makes Egypt very wealthy and, and keeps the people surrounding them alive. And this is where we're at in our point of the story today. Our scripture starts off with the 11 brothers and Jacob standing around. Now, Jacob and his family, they're in dire straits like everybody else. Severe drought, which means that they've got no food. They have run out of food, and they don't know what they're going to do. But Jacob finds out that there is grain for sale in Egypt. And they've got the cash for it. They've got the silver for it. So all they've got to do is travel to Egypt, buy the grain, bring it back, and then their families will be saved. All of the families will be saved. And you've got to think about this for a second. Your family is starving. Your family is starving, you have the money, you found out where the food was, what are you going to do? You're going to go get it, right? I mean, immediately, they got food there, all right, I'll see you, I'll be back in a couple days. That's what you're going to do, you're going to pack up, you're going to leave. But what are the brothers doing? In the very beginning of this, what are the brothers doing instead? Verse 1, when Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I've heard that there's grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some food for us so that we will not die. I want you to think about that for a second. Because a lot of times people just skim over that thinking the brothers are lazy or, or you know the brothers don't feel like making a trip this time of year. There's food in Egypt. Each one of these brothers has their own families now because 10 years have passed since we last heard about them. They all have their own families. They all have their own kids. Their families are starving. They heard that there's food in Egypt. And instead of heading right down to Egypt and getting some food, what do they stay? What do they do? They stand around and look at each other. Not saying a word. Just staring at each other. Why? Why? It's because of guilt. It is because of guilt. I'm telling you, if this was anywhere besides Egypt, that it said, go down to Mesopotamia, the guys would be like, okay, I'm off, we're traveling. But he said, Egypt. And immediately when they heard Egypt, their ears popped up, the red flag went off, and all they could think about in their mind were these regrets, which came flooding back and said, Egypt. That's a place that we sold our brother to into slavery. And they're just standing there looking at each other thinking, we supposed to do now as all of these horrible <coughs> memories flood back into their minds because with these memories come regrets regrets over the poor decisions that they made 10 years ago and they're just frozen just frozen standing there looking at each other not knowing what to say or what to do we all have these things in our lives we all have these things in our lives that we would just like to forget. It would just be nicer if we could forget that they ever happened. But for some reason or another, they come flooding back into us. 
It reminds me of a preacher who was uh, once giving a sermon against alcohol. He was preaching against alcohol and in much enthusiasm he said, If I had all of the beer in the world, I'd throw it in the river. And then with even more excitement he said, If I had all of the wine in the world, I'd toss it right in the river. And then even more loudly he said, If I had all of the whiskey in the world, I'd throw it in the river. And then he sat down in his chair. And the song leader hesitantly uh, stood up, addressed the congregation, and said, Let's continue on our worship with our closing song, number 365, Shall We Gather at the River? <laughs> Sometimes we make mistakes that we can look back on and laugh about it. You know, th those are things that we're not going to forget, but that's okay. It's, it's a joke that we can tell to, to our friends, you know, later on in life. Sometimes, however, there are things that we look back on that simply haunt us. And I don't know what you've done in, in your past that you look on with regret. But I'm guessing that there's probably some kind of memory, some kind of memory that comes into your mind every once in a while that wipes a smile right off your face. Some kind of thought that takes the joy right out of your heart. I don't know what yours is, but I know that you probably have one because I have them myself. And that's what these 11 brothers were experiencing right now at this moment. And remember, they didn't sell him into slavery last week. We know that there's been at least 10 years that have passed. Because we know that, that Joseph went to Potiphar, served him for a while. We know he went to prison. We know two years after he was in prison was when Pharaoh called him up. And then we know there were seven good years. We know a minimum of 10 years, probably longer than that. Probably anywhere between 10 and 20 years is how long it's been since they've sold their brother into slavery. And what happens, 20 years later, what happens? The mere mention of the word Egypt is enough to stop them dead in their tracks. It's enough to take all of their joy out of their life and take all of the words off of their lips. And what we see in the rest of this story is what God does sometimes in the life of His people when they have these regrets in their lives but aren't killing them. When they have these regrets that they try to push all the way to the back of their minds so they don't have to fix them, sometimes God has to take an active stance. Uh, he has to act proactively to help us get through these. And, and this is what we're going to learn in this. And here's the first thing that we can learn. First of all, when we refuse to work through the issues that we have to talk about there, the things that we regret, the things that take away our joy, sometimes God puts us in situations where we have to deal with them whether we want to or not. I mean, think about it. These 11 brothers would do anything, anything, except think about their brother Joseph. And that's what they've been doing for the last 20 years. They've been thinking about anything besides Egypt, anything about Joseph. But now, God shoves them into the situation that they have to go to the place that they sold their brother to. Whether they wanted to or not, this is something that they have to do. God has laid this right in front of them. And this is the first thing that we need to understand. In order to move past our regrets, in order to move past these bad memories, these mistakes that we've made, first thing we have to do is we actually have to think about them. We have to focus on them. You can't just keep them back here because if you don't think about it, you're never going to be able to move past it. And this is what God forced the boys to do. They had to think about it. So they head off to Egypt and they go to buy the uh, grain that they need um, and they have all of their silver and they go to the guy that can sell it to them and this guy just happens to be Joseph. And they all show up at Joseph and, and Joseph uh, recognizes them immediately but, but they're in such a different place and Joseph looks so different and, and he's even using an interpreter so that they don't even know that he speaks their language. They don't recognize him. And they come before him, and Joseph, he can't get into all of the issues right away, so instead he accuses them of being spies. He said, you guys are spies that have come to my land to, to steal information so that you can come and invade. They said, no, we're not. We're not spies. And he throws them in jail for three days. For three days he puts them in jail. And this is the second thing that we need to understand. Sometimes, in order to move past our regrets, to work through our mistakes, there are repercussions that we must face. These ten brothers, these ten brothers, because Benjamin stayed at home, ten brothers that are there, they're treated harshly. They are. Joseph is not very kind, and they're accused of being spies, and they are thrown into prison. They are punished, and they are forced to deal with these things, 
as they work through their emotions. And they believe that all this is happening because of what they did to Joseph. This is helping them focus on the things that they have done. Surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come upon us. The punishment the brothers were enduring helped them to focus on their past so that they could begin to work through. And sometimes, guys, we need to endure some pain to be able to get past our regrets. Maybe it's the, the pain of confessing something that, that someone else never knew actually took place. I know this is a juvenile example, but when I was 16, I borrowed my uh, dad's van. And I actually wound up backing the van into a little tree, and I broke the uh, taillight on the back of it. And I drove home, and I parked it. And a couple days later, Dad noticed that the taillight was busted. And he asked me, hey, you know what happened to the taillight? Well, I knew he didn't have anything on me, so what did I say? Ooh, I have no idea what happened to the taillight. Oh, maybe a bird hit it, flew into the back. Yeah, I just can't, maybe in a parking lot. I gave him all kinds of scenarios, but it wasn't me. Definitely wasn't me. I think I've even ever confessed that to him. I'll call him later today and let him know that. But, but I lived with that. I thought about that. Every time I saw that taillight, it reminded me, I lied to my dad about that. And if I had wanted to work through this emotion, what would I have done? I would have told him what happened and then dealt with the repercussions. And I don't know what the punishment would have been, but there would have been one from my dad. But sometimes, in order to get through the past, the pain, the regrets, you have to sometimes deal with the pain of confessing it. Confessing it to the person you have maybe have hurt. Maybe you've hurt somebody and, and, and you regret it. Then talk to them about it. Don't just pretend like the past is the past. Actually do something about it to get past these regrets and move to the future. If there's something in your life that haunts you from time to time, that means that you have never truly dealt with the pain of what has happened. And sometimes when we don't deal with the pain on our own, when we don't say, okay, I'm going to work through this, I'm going to take care of this, God throws us into a situation that forces us to work through it. And He intervenes in our lives and He confronts us with it. And that's what He did in these boys' lives. Three days later, these boys come out of prison and they go before Joseph again and He makes a deal with them. He says, okay, you say you're not spies, I say you are spies, so here's what you're going to do. If you really aren't a spy, then, then I'm going to sell you the grain, you're going to go home, and then you're going to bring your one brother, uh, your youngest brother, supposedly that you have Benjamin, back to me so that I can see him and see if he's actually your brother. So he sends him out. He sends the uh, brothers out, but he keeps one of them as a prisoner. Simeon he keeps as a prisoner, just in assurance that they will come back and, and prove that they are who they are. So the brothers, they give their silver, they get the grain, they head off, and they head back towards their, their home. And while they're going, it, it's time to take a rest. It, it's time to camp out for the night. One of the brothers opens a sack to get some grain out to give it to his donkey. And lo and behold, there's the silver in it. The brothers freak out. They do. They have no idea how the silver got back in their packs, but they're assuming this is not good. Verse 27 seven says, At the place where they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sack to get feed for his donkey, and he saw his silver in the mouth of his sack. My silver has returned, he said to his brothers. Here it is in my sack. Their hearts sank. And they turned to each other trembling and said, What is this that God has done to us? You see, they recognized God's hand in the whole thing. They were afraid what was going to happen next, but they recognized that God was at play right here, right now. He was the one that was arranging these events. And here's the last thing that I want you to remember about facing your fears and regrets. God will be with you every step of the way. He will not abandon you. It does not matter what you have done in the past. God will continue to be with you. As you make mistakes, He will be there for you. As you work through your past mistakes, He will be there for you. As you commit future mistakes, He will be there for you. God will never abandon you, and He will see it through the end. He will provide you the strength that is necessary. Just because you've done something wrong does not mean that God turns His back on you. And just because you think about it so that you can deal with what you've done wrong does not mean that He's going to turn around. And God didn't turn around. And these boys go home, and they tell their dad everything that's happened. And they tell him that the uh, youngest son, Benjamin, has to go back in order to free Simeon. Simeon is locked in prison, and he's not going to be released until Benjamin goes back. And Joseph, the dad who likes to pick favorites, what does he say? He says, no way. I already lost Joseph, who is my youngest son. I am not sending Benjamin. And losing my second youngest son, Simeon can just stay there. 
it's really not worth the risk to me. Like, I know one kid who's not sending his dad a Father's Day card this next year. But the part of this story, this chapter ends with Simeon sitting in jail, Joseph saying, no way, we're, we're, we're not going back. And the brothers continuing to work through their mistakes, their regrets from the past. So when we think about this story, when we start to apply it to our own lives, it, it, it kind of gives us a formula that we need to follow. If you have regrets, if you have things that you would like to forget, but, but just keep coming back in your mind, then, then, then first of all, you have, to, you have to think about it. You have to focus on it. You can't just keep shoving it to the back of your mind and say, I never want to think about this again. You have to deal with the emotions and with the repercussions. And that's the second thing. If there are repercussions from the actions, then be willing to face it. Be willing to say, whatever it takes to get through this, whoever I need whatever punishment comes along with it, then I will do what it takes to get through this so that I am no longer haunted by my past. That's the second thing that we need to do. And you can do that by, by, by confessing it to whoever you've heard, by talking to your pastor, by, by talking to someone else that you trust and just letting them know, this is what I'm ashamed of from my past, this is what I need help working through. And when you begin to focus on it, then you can begin the process of recovery that you've been putting off for so long. Because we've been working on it, the idea, just don't think about it, we won't have to deal with it. And then the last thing that you have to remember is when you start down this path of recovery, when you start down this road to forgiveness, forgiving yourself and allowing God to completely forgive you, He will be with you every single step of the way. He will not leave you, will not forsake you, He will not be on your own. So I'm asking you today, as you leave this place, just think about your own life. Think about those things that you have in your lives. That, that, that when you think about them, they wipe the smile right off your face. That a word or a smell or a reminder of them can ruin your day. Think about those things. And then pray and ask God to help you begin the process of working through your regrets and your mistakes. Because I'm promising you, if you don't take this upon yourself to do it now, God's going to throw it in your lap one of these days. Because He wants you to get through it one way or another. So let's start this together on our own. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you that you are so loving, that you are so forgiving, God, that you do not hold our past against us, God. But we can't say the same for ourselves. We make mistakes. We make mistakes that, that we constantly think about, that constantly hurt us, that constantly haunt us, God. And I ask that you would please help us. Help us to be strong enough to, to focus on what we have done. Help us to stand up to confess it, to uh, deal with the repercussions of it, God, so that we can once and finally be able to move forward, God, so that we no longer have to be plagued with the past, we can just have a, a clear conscience, God. We ask this in Christ's name, and all God's children said, Amen.